Okay, I just want to uh, touch just briefly uh, what's in that book. Particularly, I don't think we finished all of the uh, 10B, the struggle of sanctification and the enemies. The only thing I wanted to really touch and see if you had any questions or comments, the basic enemies are obviously are the uh, flesh and the world, and we talked about those, I think. Uh, we didn't talk so much about the devil. And particularly the, the problematic thing among Christians is the question of the extent of which the devil can, uh, or demons, can actually affect us. And there are some people that just adamantly feel that a Christian cannot have a demon in him. And then there are others that uh, feel that Christians can. And I don't know where you are. What we suggested in the book, and what I am inclined to believe, is the latter. Uh, I, I don't think there's anything in the Bible that says that a Christian cannot have a demon. That, was, that is basically the, a logical conclusion. One of the primary sources of that, or at least one of the main books, was a book by a professor, Old Testament professor at Dallas, Merrill Unger, who wrote a book, Biblical Demonology. But the logic there was basically the Christian has the Holy Spirit, and a demon can't dwell where the Holy Spirit is. Uh, interestingly, uh, Dr. Unger, before he died, uh, wrote a little book changing his mind. <laughs> and what it seems like is those that adamantly feel that fundamentally come from that theological perspective, but that uh, a lot of people, particularly those that have been on the mission field, would argue to the contrary. There was a president of Wheaton a long time ago, V. Raymond Edmund, maybe some of you have heard his name, but he says, theology says no, experience says yes. And he was a missionary in Latin America. Uh, and then, of course, Neil Anderson, his ministry, Bondage Breaker and uh, Freedom in Christ, fundamentally dealt with that. Uh, going into churches and talking about this, and then actually having uh, consultations, I guess say, or appointments with people that felt they were in bondage to the devil or had symptoms of that, which is basically, sometimes they would hear voices. Uh, they simply could not, some of them couldn't really pray. As soon as they started praying, they would black out, those kind of things. And uh, through Neil's process in freedom in ministry was not to cast the demons out. It was, his belief was, if you receive the truth of God, the demon will have to leave. And so his point was with them is to bring them to the place where they would receive the truth and the demons would leave. Now, sometimes the demons would would prohibit the person from actually receiving the word of God. In other words, would just, you know, they would blank. And so at that point, he would uh, step in and uh, cause the demon to stop doing that. But his feeling was if you just cast a demon out of somebody, then that person, you know, he didn't, his will wasn't involved in it. And what Neil wanted to, to uh, help the person understand is that when I take in the word of God, the demon can't be there. When I really take in truth, the demon has to leave. And so he wanted them to see that and to exercise their own will to take the word of God so that they could uh, do that in future times when they felt trouble like that. So the question is, what do you think? Uh, uh, let me just explain what I understand at least I do not think that the demon comes into a believer and dwells in the same place where the Holy Spirit does. In other words, I don't think that the demon dwells in the heart 
like the Bible says, the Holy Spirit comes to dwell in our heart. And I, I think what uh, Dalich in his System of Biblical Psychology, he talks about the demon coming in and, and blocking the soul or the, you know, the spirit intervening between the chemical and, and uh, electrical system that we have that functions and blocking the spirit from utilizing that and the demon coming in and utilizing, making the person think and do what the demon wants to do. So that it's an intervention of the demon, not at the core of the heart, but between the heart or the spirit that, that uh, environ, you know, makes everything alive and, and taking that over, taking over the electrical chemical system of our body and our mind. So uh, the question is, is, is that true? Can a demon do that? And I think there's a lot of evidence that they can. Most people would acknowledge that a demon can plant thoughts in your mind. And I'm not sure how they can do that without coming in. <laughs> you see what I mean? You all of a sudden have a thought that, say, would be demonic. Uh, they must come in and do something in the mind for that thought to arise right away. You know, if you say that the demon can't dwell where the Holy Spirit does, the question is, where is your spirit in relationship to the Holy Spirit? And that has to be very close, because actually he would be indwelling your holy, your spirit, and your spirit is sinful at times. So uh, it's true what you're saying. I don't know that you can argue that where the Holy Spirit is, that the a demon cannot be there at all. So either way, it it doesn't. But by the way, possession, and I think you recognize that possession is not a good word because it can sound like ownership. And we are, as Christians, we are owned by God, not by a demon. So it really means, and the word doesn't, no, no place in the Bible does it use a word really possessed in the sense of ownership. It just talks about being demonized. Uh, any other thoughts or questions? Uh, it, that's one thing I think in the Western church we don't talk about at all. But I would simply say from the experience of Freedom in Christ Ministries, we should be talking about it more. There are people, uh, well, some people think you can't, a demon comes and takes over your body. Well, does alcohol come and take over your brain? You see, a Christian can do things that essentially they give themselves over to something that takes over whether it's a demon, whether it's drugs, whether it's alcohol, sometimes you really kind of lose yourself and are taken over by some, some other power, so to speak. I remember a couple of times being with a man that did possess up, and, and they were Biola students, which was interesting. And uh, he cast the demons out. He would, he would call the demon up and ask the name of the demon. And then he would cast the demon. And I remember when the demon would come up that the features of the person's face, particularly the eyes, it looked like it was a different person in there. And when the demon was out, the person had no recollection of the, the conversation that this uh, person had with the demon. He would call them up and ask them the name. He would tell the demon, uh, you have to obey Christ, and the demon would agree with that. And then he would finally, uh, one, one time I remember, he called the demon up and asked him the name. This was another man, and also a Bible student. And you know what, the, and then when it was over, he asked the fellow, do you know what the name of the demon was? And he says, no. The name of the, the, the demon called himself, uh, What's that music from uh, Jamaica? Reggae. Reggae. He, he, his name was Reggae. And when he said, he asked, do you know what he said? No. Well, he, the man said, his he's told his name Reggae. Oh, Reggae, the guy said. He, 
he knew who it was. And you listen to all kinds of music that was apparently, that's another thing, class, this other man about, out of whom the demon was uh, cast by this man. Not very long later, he got into his little Volkswagen, cranked up the radio, and uh, he, he, was, he got it through rock music. That's where the demon was, he identified himself, and the man would go back in and turn that up and get reinfested with demons. So class, you know, watch, at least keep the volume down. No, I won't get it. <laughs> so class, think about that, because the demons operate in different ways. And see, here they might not do so many miraculous things. I think they do miraculous things in places. That's another thing you should keep in mind, uh, that as far as signs and wonders in the New Testament, the references to signs and wonders after the Gospels, I think, are only with uh, demons. Remember, the devil is going to do signs and wonders to deceive the elect. Second Thessalonians talks about it and other places. So miracles always don't. I, I personally think some of the shamans do miraculous things, superhuman things. And uh, so they're not doing it by the Holy Spirit, I don't think. OK, uh, but here in America, see, they would do it by all kinds of things, like music. But they, what they do, at least at Freedom in Christ ministry, they simply block somebody from growing, period. They just cannot worship. You cannot pray, you cannot read the Bible, they just block people from doing it. Somebody. And that's the uh, ministry that they have. Okay, any thoughts or questions? All right, then the, uh, I want to go to perfectionism. Did you uh, solve all the sanctification through suffering? And since you want to grow, you want to have more suffering along the way, because that's the avenue of growth. No, but we should, uh, God said we would have it, that in some sense we walk the same road that Jesus did, and that is glory through suffering. That's pretty much what he says. If you suffer with me, you will reign with me. And so we should expect in this life. And we should, uh, in a sense, Thank God not for the suffering, but thank God maybe for what he's doing in it. And see that when the suffering comes, really as opportunities to, in some sense, wean us from the world, draw us to God, many things God does through us in that. Okay, perfectionism. I don't want to labor that either, either because I want to get to per, the perseverance, but I do want to mention, I think in looking back at what uh, the text said that you read, uh, to me it gave the idea that he was saying that the perfectionist said that you don't sin anymore. That's, I'm not sure that's totally correct. Let me read you a little bit of what the writer in the um, Evangelical Dictionary of Theology says, this is of Wesley, and that's the main group of perfectionists. Uh, the Nazarene Church uh, believes in perfectionism, and I think some other groups, but they are the uh, main ones. I, I went to George Fox College for two years, and they taught perfectionism at that point. Although they're not Nazarene, it's basically uh, Friends or Quaker school. But anyway, uh, yeah, I remember a man coming, a special lecturer, and he put three hearts on the board. The sinful heart, the unsaved heart, had a black stripe down the middle. The Christian heart, when you just become a Christian, you had a red stripe and a black stripe. The red stripe meaning the new heart. And then perfectionism, you just had a red stripe, the black was gone. That was kind of interesting because in that school, they also believed that you could lose your salvation. And so they would have uh, meetings, fall and, and evangelistic meetings, fall and spring, and the same students would get saved over and over even after they 
the testimony was this. They would say, I'm saved and sanctified. And that meant that they had reached that second place where they, well, obviously, I, I would kid them sometimes, but they, uh, they could still fall into sin. They could be without sin and then be like Adam and Eve and then fall again. And so some of them did that, you know, every year type of a thing. But at any rate, here's what Wesley apparently really taught. He taught that perfect love or Christian perfection could replace pride through a moral crisis of faith. He did not see perfection as sinlessness, nor did he understand it to, to be attained by merit. And then skipping a little, in this life, the Christian does not attain absolute Christ-likeness, but suffers numerous infirmities, human faults, prejudices, and involuntary transgressions. These, however, were not considered sin, for Wesley saw sin as attitudinal and relational. In the plain account of Christian perfection, he stressed that Christian perfection is not absolute nor sinless, nor incapable of being lost, is not the perfection of Adam or the angels, and does not preclude growth in grace. He tended to, to narrow sin to include, and I think this is a thought you probably should remember, to include only conscious will and intent. So conscious, willful, intentional sin you could get beyond that. But inadvertent sin, uh, just inadvertently stumbling at times, maybe something slipping out you didn't really want to say, he would consider that not sin because the attitude of the heart was perfectly in love with the God. The other thing I wanted to comment on is uh, a little bit uh, Erickson's discussion of perfectionism. How many of you think that when Jesus says, be ye perfect as your heavenly Father is, that that is a call for absolute sinlessness? Because the argument there is basically the Bible calls us, the perfectionist argument is the Bible calls us to perfectionism. Therefore, we should be able to attain that if he commands us to do it. And that's one of the commands that the Bible says, be ye perfect as your Father in heaven is perfect. Now, Erickson takes that verse and, and tries to show how the word for perfect, teleos, does not mean absolute perfection. It, it kind of means a wholeness, I think he says, or a completeness. So what is your take on that? Be ye perfect as your Father in heaven is perfect. Is that a call to, per to perfection? You're not committing. Yeah. So are you saying it's a call to, to uh, seek perfection, sinlessness? Now, personally, I think it is. I don't think that that's now. You have an interesting place where the both Two times that word is used, and obviously one of them seems to be uh, like uh, Erickson was explaining it, and that's in Philippians 3. You remember that place he says, where he talks about he wants to know God and the power of his resurrection and so forth. Not that I have already obtained it or have already become perfect. But then he goes on to say, uh, well, a few verses later, he says, let us, therefore, as many as are perfect, have this attitude. And that's the same word. That is pretty interesting that the same Greek word is, in one case, saying, I'm not perfect. And then the, another one, he basically says, as many of us as are perfect, let them think this way. So I would agree. There are places where perfect means uh, more mature, but not sinless. But there are also places where God calls us to absolute perfection. I simply want to mention that because I don't see necessarily why the call and command to be absolutely sinless means that we can necessarily attain it. I think it's like when you tell a child, don't do something. Let's say a little child spills his milk, just 
has fun knocking stuff off the table. You say, don't do that. You don't mean don't do it most of the time, but some of the time it's, you mean don't do that, period. But you don't actually expect him never to do that again. <laughs> Isn't that true? I mean, you, but the command is always to perfection in whatever you're telling him. Don't lie. Well, he will probably lie again. And depending on the maturity, you will look at him that way. And so I think that's the way we look at it in the Bible. God commands us to be perfect in many places. How could he give a command to be less than perfect? You see what I mean? He would never do that. But uh, I don't know that it means that we can attain that in this life. It's simply sometime, someday we will be sinless. Any questions on perfectionism? Yes. I would say that would be a s amount of the same thing. Yeah, holy is, is to be, well, you know what holiness means now, to be absolutely separate. And in that sense, when it's telling me to be holy, I think it's talking about separation from sin. So it would be, especially if you say, be holy as I'm holy. See, that was actually the command in the Old Testament and carried over into, I think Peter says it, doesn't he, in the New Testament. Well, there's, there's a lot of commands. Most of God's commands, when he says, love God with all your heart, I think he means perfect love. And love your neighbor as yourself, I think he means perfect love. Not a love mixed with kind of hatred or whatever the opposite is. Okay, any other questions on perfectionism? Anybody perfect in here? No. I mean, the Bible, the verses that were used by uh, Erickson in there, it seems to me that they clearly showed that the Bible seems to indicate that we sin. Uh, it does kind of put it in, in 1 John, and maybe we've talked about that or it'll come up in uh, the perseverance. First John, it says, he that is begotten of God does not sin, but uses present tense. But then it says in 1 John 2, 1, if anyone sins, and there it's an aorist tense, it's not saying if anyone continually sins, we have an advocate. But it does seem to indicate that they expect someone to sin and that Jesus is our advocate in those instances. Okay, let's go to the doctrine of perfection, which is the question really of can a real, genuinely born again person uh, be, lose their salvation? That's the way it uh, finally is put. Now, various answers to the question, the Catholic Church believes that they can. In fact, all mortal sins, the Council of Trent says, render men children of wrath and enemies of God. Uh, I, you know, I guess I think of things too, not tech, well, technically in a sense. I was just wondering whether the Catholic Church, how they really believe that. Because the only cure of a mortal sin is confession. But what if the person goes out and commits a mortal sin. Between that time and confession, if he died, logically he would go to hell, right? I wonder if they actually believe that. Because, see, that's the same thing that I think of when we talk about regenerate, baptism or regeneration. The way to think about that class, I think, is if somebody comes to Christ at say, let's say 11 o'clock at night, and they genuinely accept Christ as their savior, but they can't be baptized, you know, maybe till the morning. Or, you know, between that time, if they die, are they saved and go to heaven? And if so, then baptism cannot be regenerative because they're already gen regenerated. See, whatever baptism is, it cannot be the place where they're actually regenerated, faith would be that. And so if you run into somebody that wants to do that, I remember when we were talking about the Orthodox faith around here, 
and someone wanted to say it's not causative, but it's the occasion. I was a philosopher, by the way, that made that distinction. Baptism, he, wanted, he didn't want to be, uh, baptism were a generation guy, but he did want to have baptism related to regeneration, so he said it's not causal, but it's occasional. Well, see, that's the question. If somebody believes in Christ, does he have to wait for the occasion <laughs> to be regenerated? And uh, I think that raises a lot of question with trying to make that distinction uh, work. Okay, then the uh, the Council of Trent anathematized quite a few people, didn't they? If anyone maintained that a man once justified cannot lose grace, and therefore that he who falls and sins never was truly justified, let him be accursed. All you Calvinists are done for <laughs> as far as that statement is concerned. Then Augustine, some might be saved, this is kind of strange, some might be saved who were not of the elect, but these might fall away. So he was sure that the elect would never fall, but some possibly could be saved and then fall away that were not elect. That, I think, is, I don't know where that's found in the Bible. Arminius, now James Arminius himself did not come to a conclusion on this problem. Uh, but the Arminians, I think, pressed his logical uh, teaching on election and free will and this type of thing to the conclusion that to, to logically uh, you could fall. If, you, if your will is the deciding coming in, I guess they thought your will could decide to leave. Popular Arminianism just simply says any saved person, that's what we've been talking about, where it has come today. You think of an Arminian as someone who can lose their salvation. That's why a lot of Baptists, to be honest with you, they think of themselves as Calvinists, totally on this point. Uh, the church I went to for a long time, I remember the pastor saying, with regard to salvation, the devil votes against you, God votes for you, and you cast the deciding vote. That was his thought with regard to salvation, but when it came to this, he didn't think that uh, anybody could be lost that was genuinely saved. A reformed or Calvinist, a truly saved person, will certainly persevere to the end and therefore cannot be lost. Now the concept of perseverance, and you notice we use the word perseverance rather than eternal security. They ultimately say the same thing in terms of the end, but the, the uh, reformed tend to use perseverance because it uh, speaks of the Christians persevering rather than they're just secure, which some people feel gives people the right to say no matter what you do, you're secure. And the reform, I think the true biblical teaching, as we'll see here, is not that. It is, you could put it this way and we will, God preserve, you persevere. And they put the emphasis on the perseverance of the saints. So the concept, as Burkhoff puts it, that continuous operation of the Holy Spirit and the believer by which the work of divine grace that is begun in the heart is continued and brought to completion. And uh, that doesn't emphasize so much the believer's perseverance, but uh, it does look at it as a continual process. Some observation, it doesn't mean merely the elect will certainly be saved in the end, in other words, that they could be saved, lost, saved, lost, but they will end up as a lack. They will end up saved. It doesn't mean that. Secondly, it doesn't say that the saved individual cannot fall into sin. The Holy Spirit will keep him from sin, which would lead to the loss of salvation. What it basically says, class, is that I don't think a genuine person from the core of his heart can actually renounce Christ as his Savior that people could deny Christ. Peter did that. Three times he did it. 
or twice he did it before the cocks of three times. But do you think he still had faith in his heart when he even got to the place of swearing when they last asked him? You know, he was he was adamant that he didn't know this man or have anything to do with him. That's pretty strong renunciation of his relationship with Christ. Was he lost? Why would you say he wasn't lost? It seems to me because it talks about in one of the Gospels it says Jesus looked at him and then he remembered the words and he went out and wept bitterly. So that was a, that was a kind of a surface thing based on fear, but deep in his heart, uh, he still, you know, when God, when he, Jesus looked at him and remembered his word, what was really there came out. Okay, the nature of the work of perseverance. It's the work of God, and we'll see that in many of the verses. It also includes the means of man's persevering. And uh, let me just read these verses. Well, I gave them to you, I think, didn't I? Uh, John 8, if you abide in my word, then you are truly disciples of mine, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. See that? If you abide is a third-class condition, which a Greek grammar says, a matter of doubt, but with some expectation of realization. I think the idea is it's a more probable uh, condition. Okay, uh, so the question there, if you abide, you are my disciples. It doesn't mean just if you come in once. It means if you stay in, you are disciples. Hebrews 3.14, for have become partakers of Christ, if we hold fast the beginning of our assurance firm until the end. And then Peter says there, who are protected by the power of God through faith. So that in Hebrews is a third class condition again. In some sense, and I don't know if we mentioned it in this class, but uh, in Theology 4 we do, we talk about conditional covenants. In some sense, class, our security, our perseverance is conditional. How can you get away from it? We have become particular. If we hold fast the beginning of our assurance, if we abide, there is a condition that is attached. Colossians 1, yet he has now reconciled, if indeed you continue in the faith, firmly established and steadfast, and not moved away from the hope of the gospel. And Matthew 10, it is the one who has endured to the end who will be saved. So there are these conditions for salvation. And so perseverance would mean that these conditions will be met by God's grace. Now, the relationship with the divine human act, and as we said, God preserves, man perseveres. Those are two words that I think express the relationship. Philippians 2, work out your salvation, for it is God who has work in you. God works, but we also must work. Jude 21, keep yourselves in the love of God. That's perseverance. Verse 24, now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling. In other words, we keep ourselves, but we keep by the ability of God and his grace. Second Timothy, nevertheless, the firm foundation uh, of God stands, having this seal, the Lord knows those who are his. And let everyone who names the name of the Lord abstain from wickedness. When it says the Lord knows, that doesn't mean he just is cognizant of it. It means he attends. He, con he is concerned with them. He has a relationship with them. Yes? Uh, yes, it is. But it doesn't eliminate man persevering. I mean, I, I think from my belief in perseverance, I would have to agree with the first part. That God preserves, that's going to keep man persevering. Yeah. But it doesn't eliminate the other one. It doesn't say, well, God's going to do it, I don't have to do anything. It, 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 You've got to keep the perseverance is just as much a part of Scripture as God's preserving. 
you've just highlighted the relationship between the two, that the one will keep the other one going. But it still a, comes in the Bible as a condition. I must persevere. It's easy to say, well, God does it. I don't need to worry about it. And I don't know that you need to worry. Yeah, you do need to worry about it. I think if you start drifting away from God, you should be worried. You should be concerned. As the Bible says, if you remain. And so if you find yourself not remaining, then you need to heed Paul's words where he says, examine yourselves to see whether you're in the faith or whether you have believed in vain. Okay, uh, 2 Timothy 2.19. Oh, that's the one I read already. There's two parts. 1 Peter 1.5. This puts it together pretty well, I think, in 1 Peter 1.5. We are protected by the power of God through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. And I would just emphasize that faith is what is continual. You're protected by God through faith, as long as that faith is there, and faith, according to James 2, does do some you know, works of faith. So there's some evidence of it in life. We are protected. We are protected through faith. And I think the last part of that verse, for salvation ready to be revealed in the last time, means we are protected to the final consummation. Now, we've given you a whole bunch of scriptures here, and I don't think, let's just take the first one, for example. I don't think all of them, well, I was going to say all of them aren't as strong as some of them. I don't think all of them conclusively, maybe that's too strong. I don't think all of them are of equal strength. Uh, John 10 is one that is often used. Uh, some of the words in there, let me just read through it. You all know the words that are used, I think. My sheep hear my voice, I know them, they follow me, and I give eternal life to them, and they shall never perish. No one shall snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of the Father's hand. I and the Father are one. So we're in the Father's hand, we're in the Son's hand, and there is no possible one that can snatch you out of that. What would an Arminian say? What would you say if you were an Arminian to this verse? See, that's the usual answer. No one can take you out, but you can jump out. Yeah, but you could all, you would determine whether you're one of them, but you would also, even if you felt you were one, you would say, I still have the right to jump out. The verse doesn't preclude that, you see. It just says no one can do it. And most people would say that no one else, so to speak, but they, they would think that the verse doesn't preclude you from willing to leave at some point. Uh, any thoughts on that? I personally think that that's hard to uh, deny, that the verse doesn't preclude that clearly, that the person can walk out. So I would not say this is one of the stronger verses. What I want to do through here is just highlight the verses that I think are the strongest for perseverance. So we'll just pick ones along the way. The, and some of those probably are stronger than others, but the first one, and you might just highlight these, is the second one, Jude 1, where it says, Jude, a bondservant of Jesus Christ and brother of James, to those who are the called, beloved in God the Father, kept for Jesus Christ. And the word kept is a present passive part of being kept for Jesus Christ. And see, that basically doesn't say that I can leave. If God is keeping me, then you almost have to suggest somebody stronger than God uh, can leave. 
that probably not the most conclusive verse either, but it seems to, what you need to find verses class is where the keeping and the, the uh, preservation eliminates your action. It doesn't seem to allow your action in that. Now the next one, John 6, 37 and 39, I also think is pretty strong. All that the Father gives me shall come to me, and the one who comes to me I will certainly not cast out. Well, so Jesus is saying, I'm never going to cast him out. But in verse 39, this is the will of him who sent me, that all that he has given me, I lose nothing but raise it up on the last day. And that's the uh, resurrection time of the believer. Now, to me, that's pretty strong. It's the will of God that Jesus lose loses none. And then if you look at some of these others, uh, John 17, 2, let me just read some of those verses. It seems to tie that together, that Jesus, Jesus is keeping them. Oh, I got Acts. John 17, 2, even as thou givest him authority over all mankind, that to all whom thou hast given him, he may give eternal life. And then in verse 12, while I was with them, I was keeping them in thy name, which thou hast given me, and I guarded them, and not one of them perished, but the son of perdition, that the scripture might be fulfilled. Now, I don't think he is saying, I guarded them, but one of the ones I guarded, I lost. Because if you look at uh, 18 and 9 and uh, 8 and 9, there it says, I told you that I am he. If therefore you seek me, let these go their way. They're over there in the garden. And uh, that the word may be fulfilled which he spoke of those whom thou hast given me, I lost none. And so Jesus is guarding his disciples, and he doesn't lose any, according to these verses. Okay, the next one also, 1 Corinthians 1, 8 and 9, who, who shall also confirm you to the end, blameless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. And that's just a statement. God will confirm you to the end, blameless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. And he says, God is faithful. And again, it doesn't seem to say anything about what you do about the matter here. God confirms you to the end. Uh, another one down at 7, Philippians 1, 6. I am confident of this very thing, that he who began a good work in you will perfect it until the day of Christ. And uh, so the thought is, Paul just says, I'm confident that you're going to, be at the end. I don't know if he could do that if he was, I was going to say if he was an Arminian, but couldn't have been an Arminian at that point. Now the next one to me is, is one of the stronger ones, and that is the question of the Holy Spirit as a seal. And you find that in a couple of places. Ephesians 1, 13 is one of them. In him you also, having listened to the message of the truth, the gospel of your salvation, having also believed, you were sealed in him with the Holy Spirit of promise, who is given as a pledge of our inheritance with a view to the redemption of God's own possession. Now notice, we are God's possession at that point. And he has put his seal on it. And then in Ephesians 4.30, you have another reference to the sealing. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. You're sealed to the end. Let me read you what, uh, oh, I think I gave this, but what Lincoln says, I think, tells you what this really means. When they believed the readers of this epistle were sealed with the Spirit, cattle and slaves were branded with their owner's seal, and so the seal was a mark of ownership and of preservation as the owner's property. In other words, you put a seal, it meant ownership 
and it was preserved till wherever they wanted to take it. Let's just say you were shipping something. You'd put your seal on it, and it was sealed to it got to its destiny, the owner's destiny. In the Old Testament, God may be set to set a sign on his elect to distinguish them as his own and protect them from destruction. So the believer's reception of the Spirit is a sign that they belong to God in a special sense and have been stamped with the character of their owner. They belong to him now, but they are also protected until he takes complete possession of them. And that's where it talks about his own inheritance. The Spirit is an eschatological seal who marks believers out as people who will be protected through the testings, the battles, and the sufferings of the end time, which are already upon them. So to me, that's, I mean, if it's got God's seal, if you're going to lose that, somebody has to be powerful enough to break that seal. And I don't know that there's anybody that can break the seal that God puts on. Uh, any questions about these? Do you think that one's strong? How would you argue against that if you were an Arminian? And maybe you are, so give me your, uh, how you would respond to this. Any thoughts? You don't think there's any way out, eh? Yes. After he sees the faith, that what? Well, yes, I would say that's true, but that would be saving faith. Oh, you mean the works of your faith? Yeah. Well, even there, that would not that would be difficult for an Armenian because most of them would say that the Christian, he is born again and he displays some works, and then he drifts away into lostness. So. Yes, oh yeah, yeah. They, you're a genuine Christian in the eyes of a, uh, we're falling away from reality, not from some false profession, no. I mean, a Calvinist would agree you could fall away from a false profession. And they, they probably would say a lot of people do that. Because, class, frankly, this is kind of an interesting question. We all know, we all hear of people that seem to be Christian. They profess Christianity, and then they fell away. And the Arminian says they lost their salvation. The Calvinist says they were never saved. But the interesting thing is it kind of amounts to the same thing. It, as far as existential uh, analysis, and even in the person's own life, it would be the same thing. You know, I'm not a Christian, so the question was whether I, was I ever a Christian or did I lose Christianity? So they could say you're sealed to the end, but that's just the goal. It yeah. could be interrupted. So it's like God's holding out the end, and any time you want to come back, it's still sealed. But that would assert that I have the power to break the seal, wouldn't it? Uh, You'd have to. Why? The seal still, would be gone. Still sealed. But uh, maybe, and maybe this is wrong, but the idea I have is you're saying you're still sealed, you just don't have faith. These are two different things. But they're both necessary for salvation. So you don't have all of the necessary faith in order to be saved. I think they would be hard pressed to say you're still sealed because seal is a mark of someone belonging to God. So they couldn't say you're still sealed. And therefore, they would have to say they have the power to break the seal, which I think is pretty saying quite a bit in those verses. Uh, Second Corinthians is another passage where we are sealed. And so I won't take time to discuss that. Romans 8, 28 through 30, the argument there is, frankly, you kind of have what is often called a golden chain. It simply says, particularly verse 29, for whom he foresaw, he predestined to become formed to the image, that he might be firstborn among the brethren. Whom he predestined, this is the chain, whom he predestined, these he also called, 
whom he called, these he also justified, and whom he justified, these he also glorified. Uh, they would say there's no leakage in this chain. The same ones that are justified are glorified. It doesn't say justified and then those that remain are glorified. It just seems to say the same ones that start foreknown, justified, called, justified, are uh, finally glorified. Okay. Uh, go over to going quite a ways now. Go over to uh, this would be under Christ. Well, it's under the doctrine of, no, under the doctrine of Christ. You follow me in the outline? And go to 7E, the intercession. I taught a class once where I just had 11 students up in San Jose, and they were all members of a uh, kind of a fellowship of house churches. And to be a pastor, they were pastors of it. To be a pastor in that, they had to agree that you could lose your salvation. Uh, so that was their uh, kind of denominational. And there were two, th two arguments in all of this that they felt they could not answer. They, they admitted that, and this is one of them. So this one, I think, is pretty strong. And particularly, I'm looking at John 17, 15. And there it says, I do not ask thee to take them out of the world, but to keep them from the evil one. Uh, and this is the high priestly prayer of Jesus, and he is our intercessor. And then compare this also with verse 11. I am no more in the world, and yet they themselves are in the world. I come to thee, Holy Father, keep them in thy name, the name which thou hast given me, that they may be one as we are. So we have in this statement Jesus' prayer that the, the disciples of his would be kept and that they would be kept out of the evil one. And the picture, I think, is the disciples of Jesus are in Christ. The world lies in the evil one, the Bible says. So that's a prayer of Jesus for our keeping, for our perseverance, for our eternal security. So the question is now, are the prayers of Jesus always answered positively? Now be careful, which one are you thinking about? Now wait a minute, what was his prayer? That was his final prayer, not my will, but your will be done. Now he says, and I don't, won't take time to turn to that, but somewhere he says, well, John eleven forty one. Maybe I need to, it's not far, so I'll just look at that. John 11, 41 and 42. And so they moved the stone. This is the raising of Lazarus. And Jesus raised him his eyes and said, Father, I thank thee that thou hast heardest me. Good heavens, this Bible. And I knew that thou hearest me always because of the people standing around. I said it. God hears him always. Furthermore, Jesus says, if we pray in his name, we will get what we pray in his name. Praying in the name means to pray in who Jesus is, what he's done, his character, who he is. So it would be basically praying his will. Now, if anyone could pray in the name of Jesus, I would think it might be Jesus. And therefore, again, ask the question, are the prayers of Jesus always answered positively? <coughs> Can you think of any prayer that he made? that was not answered positively. See, Jesus didn't pray for the salvation of the world. You'll never find that prayer. So I think when he prays, God answers. And his prayer is that he would keep the disciples from the evil one. So he's praying that for us. And that's pretty strong, I think. That, that 
doesn't give me necessarily any, you know, he's going to see that I stay. Any questions about that? You may not think it as strong as the fellows in that class out there, but they didn't have any answers to that one. Uh, okay, the 80 eight is kind of the same, where we have an advocate, where we sin. Uh, of course, here an Arminian would say, well, you have him as long as you want him. But if you turn away from him, maybe they would say he doesn't do that anymore. Yeah. Well, that's the one he was mentioning, where he says, Father, if it's possible, let this pass from you. But then he closes with, not my will, but your will be done. So that's his real request. He's not sure about this other one. But isn't that kind of part of his heart's desire? It was his heart's desire, but his prayer was ultimately God's desire. Wasn't it? He didn't stop with just saying, Father, take this away from me. He said, I want your will done. If there's any way your will could be done by taking it away, he would say, yeah, I would prefer that. But I want your will be done. Yes? Has he stopped that? No. No because that wouldn't have been a prayer in Jesus' name. He wanted the Father's will. But he didn't say that, so <laughs> I am, I am, it is totally impossible to say what would have happened. That's like saying, what would have happened if he had fallen for one of the things from the devil? See, at least I take it that his prayer was, finally, I want your will. In fact, he actually says that, not mine. If that's not your will, then I don't want it. Now the next one uh, is the other one that these fellows up there didn't know how to handle, and that is 1 John 3, 9. That's over on uh, Regeneration 7e. You find it? I forget what the heading it's under there, but probably under Salvation. There must be a title. 1 John 3, 9. And this is the one that says, No one who is born of God practices sin. And I think the correct understanding of that is no one who is born of God, like it says, is characteristically practicing sin. 1 John makes it clear that we do sin, that we need to confess our sin. But he says the child of God that is truly regenerated cannot actually continually characteristically practice sin because his seed abides in him and he cannot, and that's a present tense again, should be translated, cannot habitually practice sin in his life. And so the question is, and by the way, in 1 John uh, 2 1 where it says my little children I'm writing these things that you may not sin that's not present tense I mentioned that earlier that's an aorist tense that you might not commit an act of sin but if you do commit an act of sin then you have an advocate so the question is how do you lose your salvation where you lose your salvation by <laughs> continually practicing sin I mean that's the way it generally goes now a Catholic might just do it in one mortal sin, but most of the time you drift away from God until finally you don't have anything to do with him anymore. And that is through starting to just continually practice sin. But the Bible says the one who's genuinely born of God, who has a new heart, cannot continually practice sin. And I think that, that excludes my walking away because he's talking about what I can do if I have gen genuinely been born of God. Any questions on that one? If they don't, uh, you know, if it doesn't ring, I'd like to know if you see holes in it. Uh, but anyway, those are the two, the one of Jesus' prayer and this statement. 
that these boys couldn't find any uh, response to it. Okay, uh, the next one, well, I think I will stop here. No, I'll take the next. The next one is chastening. And in Hebrews 12, it talks about uh, fundamentally God disciplines us because we are his children. And he disciplines us at the very end of that. It says, all discipline for the moment seems not to be joyful but sorrowful, yet to those who have been trained by it, afterward it yields the peaceable fruit of righteousness. And the purpose is in verse 10 that we might be partakers of his holiness. And one other thing, 1 Corinthians 11.32 is pretty significant here, I think. The people that take the Lord's Supper in an unworthy manner, it says some of them are sick and some of them sleep. That is, God actually judges them with physical death. And the reason he does that, so that their spirit might be saved, you see. So he will go. Well, when we are judged, we are disciplined by the Lord in order that we may not be condemned along with the world. So it seems to me this verse says God will go so far as to take a person's life that he, if he sins, that he might not be condemned with the world. So this is fairly strong, and it seems to leave me out of it, too. It's just what God says he does. Biola University offers a variety of biblically-centered degree programs, ranging from business to ministry to the arts and sciences. Visit biola.edu to find out how Biola could make a difference in your life.